So the graph of the secant, since secant is one over cosine, if we know the graph of the cosine, that'll explain why the graph of the secant looks the way it does. So let's look at graph of cosine, and then from that, we'll get the secant graph. So get me some axes here. And actually, I want to move that over just a little bit. Put you there. So as far as the cosine goes, I remember the cosine start at, at, at its peak of 1. And it has a period of 2 pi. So let's put pi here. And 2 pi would be then about here. And we have a min of negative 1. Pi should be about here, negative pi. So I know the cosine starts up there. It's going to, that's its max. It's going to hit its next max at 2 pi and the minimum in between at pi. So it's going to have to cross the axis at pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2. And then similar on the other side, min is going to happen here. It's going to have to hit the axis right in between. So this function just waves through here. My waves are getting better as the morning goes on. All right, so that's my graph of the cosine. Now, what I want to do is then flip the values of the cosine to see what happens. So let's try that. So in green, I'm going to do the secant. Now, if you flip a 1, you get a 1. So the secant should pass through that same point there. 1 over negative 1 is negative 1. 1 over positive 1 is still positive 1. So the secant is going to pass through the same max and mins of the cosine. Otherwise, we have problems if we have a zero, right? So if cosine is zero, I have one over zero, so that's a problem. So for example, again, the secant of pi over two is one over the cosine of pi over two, and we know the cosine of pi over two is zero, and one over zero is a problem. Uh-oh. So we can't pass through the line x equals pi over two. So like that was trouble for the tangent, it's also trouble for the secant. And similarly, anytime the cosine is a zero, the secant is going to have some trouble. But what happens otherwise? So I want to know what happens after that point right there, or after this point right there. So next, we're just going to kind of think about that graphically in the picture here, where we're going to look at what happens as x gets closer to pi over 2. So as x heads over to pi over 2, the cosine is heading to 0. So my secant of x is 1 over the cosine of x. And cosine is heading towards 0. Now, notice our y values are always positive in this area. So I'm going to have 0 and I'm positive there. So I have 1 over a small positive number. 1 over a small positive number is a big positive number. So what's going to happen is from here, this graph should head up toward its asymptote. Other side, the cosine is still positive over here. We're going to have another asymptote at negative pi over 2. But still, the y values are positive, and they're getting smaller. 1 over a small number is a big number, so the secant should do that right there. On the other side, what's going on? So as x gets close to pi over 2, but I'm on the right side. Here, I was on the left side of pi over 2. Do I have my lefts and right correct? Yep. So on the right side of pi over 2, I'm over here. So I'm letting my x value go to pi over 2. The y value is heading to 0, but it's negative. So as far as the secant goes, when I'm on the right side of pi over 2, but trying to get to pi over 2, 1 over the cosine. The cosine is going to 0, but it's negative. So I have 1 over a small negative number. 1 over a small number is a big number, so I'm going to get a big negative number. So from here, my y values are going to just drop on that side. And pretty much the same thing is going to happen on that side. So the secant are these series of U-shaped things 
that repeat over and over again. And they have these horizontal asymptotes that they can't cross. So they're di distinct chunks. And then we got to think what, about what the period of that is. Let's just look at that on a graphing calculator and we'll establish its period. Let's refresh this one. All right, so I want to look at y equals the secant of x. All right, so I can see those U-shaped pieces there. I want to confirm their asymptotes. So I believe I had an asymptote at pi over two. So if I graph x equals pi over two, I should see that asymptote that it can't cross. So as I look up here, I can see the, the vertical blue line, the green line curve is getting closer to it, but they can't touch. I mean, eventually it looks like they touch, just, but just because I had that, I'd have to zoom in to see there's still a distance there, but they don't. So I get these funky U's that go up forever, but they're constrained by these walls, these vertical asymptotes. All right, so what about the behavior of this? How, how does its repetition go? Well, I have this upward facing U and then a downward facing U, and then I get the upward facing U again. So an up and a down U is a complete cycle of this function. And let's see, how does that happen? Well, let's graph some other things. Uh, X equals negative pi over two should be another asymptote right on the left side there. So the negative pi over two and pi over two constrain this upward facing U. Counting over by another pi over two gives me three pi over two on the right. So X equals three pi over two. So I can see that other asymptote there. So uh, this, this graph makes a complete cycle, upward facing U and a downward facing U from negative pi over two all the way to three pi over two. Another way to think about that is to get from negative pi over two to pi over two is a distance of pi. And then I have another distance of pi to get there. So it looks like the period of the secant like the cosine is two pi, which was different than the tangent. Tangent had a period of pi. So we get the secant has a period of pi. And then we also discovered that anywhere the cosine had a zero, which were those odd multiples of pi over two, we're gonna get a vertical asymptote. So let's make a note of that. And we get vertical asymptotes. at odd multiples of pi over two. So let's just double check that. One pi over two, that's an asymptote. Two pi of, over twos is pi, and I have a maximum value here of that downward facing u. Three pi over twos is an asymptote. Four pi over twos is two pi, which is just fine. I have a point there. Okay, so again, just verifying that the asymptotes happen at odd multiples of pi over two. So that would be things like negative pi over two, x equals, x equals pi over two, three pi over two, five pi over two, and so on in each direction. It is a periodic function. It is not continuous like the cosine is, right? I can draw the cosine forever without lifting my pen, but the secant has these chunks that aren't connected. Okay, so it's not continuous, it is periodic because it repeats the same shape over and over again. Repeats that shape every, oops, I lied. Period is two pi, Gary. Takes me a distance of two pi to repeat that pattern. And I'm going to skip drawing the cosecant. Let's just draw it here. Let's get rid of these guys. Now, remember, the cosecant is the reciprocal of the sine. So let's look at the sine first. All 
Uh, so there's my sine function. Now, if a sine has a zero, then the cosecant is going to have a problem. It's going to have a vertical asymptote. And then otherwise, if a sine has the max, kind of like the cosine and the secant relationship, the cosecant should have a minimum because they're reciprocals. So y equals the cosecant of x. Right, so we can see that same U-shaped behavior as the secant had, it's just shifted over because remember sine and cosine are shifts of each other. So that means secant and cosecant are shifts of each other too. Um, and where the sine has a max, the cosecant has a minimum. Where the sine has a zero, the cosecant has an asymptote. So for example, at pi, the sine is zero. So if I graph the line x equals pi, I should see that's a vertical asymptote for the cosecant function. Cool. Beautiful functions, aren't they? And the period again is just like the sine, it's gonna be two pi.